Let's talk a little bit more about Joseph this morning. Last week, we heard of the young Joseph, 17 years old and his father's favorite. This favoritism added fuel to the fire of hatred from his brothers. This wasn't the only reason. Joseph had dreams. He had visions. These he shared with his brothers and his father, and they appeared to present himself, Joseph, as ruling over the others, presented them as bowing down before him. You can imagine the reaction, and of course, Scripture tells us of it as well. And the brothers were unable to see any divine origin in Joseph's dreams. They hated him even more and arranged a demise they felt certain would eliminate him from their lives. And so, when the opportunity arose, they stripped him of his precious cloak, threw him into an empty well, a dry cistern with a floor far deeper below the ground on which the brothers then sat to take a meal, literally placing themselves above Joseph in that moment. And while their original intent was for Joseph to die, they altered course slightly and just sold him into slavery. Then they took that coat and they dipped it in blood to convince Joseph's father that he was dead and went about their lives. The brothers are very intentional in trying to make sure that Joseph's visions do not come true. But what you and I know is they literally set those wheels in motion by the actions they took. And so, Joseph ends up in Egypt, purchased by an officer of Pharaoh named Potiphar. He does well by Potiphar as a young servant and becomes overseer of Potiphar's house and everything he owned, with the Lord's blessing on all. But that doesn't last because soon Potiphar's wife makes allegations against Joseph, who acts righteously, but still Potiphar doesn't believe him, but believes his wife and angrily throws Joseph into prison. But despite those wretched surroundings, Joseph continues to be blessed by God and to find favor with all those above him. Soon, he's in a position of responsibility. He's caring for all the prisoners. And the word tells us that the Lord was with Joseph, showed him steadfast love, and made everything that Joseph did prosper. And I share this context today because it underwrites today's reading. There are themes found within Joseph's life that we don't really talk a whole lot about. For instance, how God is present with Joseph. He's present in the cistern. He's present while he's in slavery. He's present as he serves Potiphar. And he's present when Joseph is a wrongly accused prisoner. And on the other hand, despite these dire circumstances that Joseph finds himself in by the actions of others, he continues to act with integrity, with faithfulness, with care and compassion for others. And he proves himself a capable manager of persons, of business, of household affairs. Ultimately, it didn't matter to Joseph where he was. He did his best work every day, regardless of the environment, regardless of the injustice that life seemed to thrust upon him and even in the face of what seems to be the bleakest future he could imagine. And he was blessed by the Lord. And we can also observe that Joseph's good work allowed God the opportunity to bless and enrich lives of others who don't know him. So chapter 39, tells us that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Jacob's sake. So this is a subtle takeaway 
that I want to make less subtle. The work we do because we know no other way than to do right and to do well by others. The work we do gives God an opportunity to bless those who might not have received a blessing, regardless of their faith. The New Interpreter's Bible commentary says it really well. What God's people say and do makes a difference regarding the welfare of others. God has chosen to depend on us to carry out the divine work in the world. And so Joseph continues this divine work, though he is still in prison. But finally, he gets an opportunity, an audience with the Pharaoh, to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams when no one else has been able to. And that's what he does. The dream of seven years of plenty that will be followed by seven years of famine. And Joseph also presents a striking plan to the Pharaoh of how to best manage these years. Pharaoh is convinced and he places Joseph in charge of Egypt, second only to himself. And of course, Joseph's interpretations are correct and Egypt experiences seven years of plenty. And Joseph does what he said he would do, stored up grain in abundance. So much grain that he just stopped measuring it. And then this is followed by seven years of famine, again, as Joseph had predicted. And when the people of Egypt were hungry, Pharaoh sent them to Joseph with the words, what he says to you, do. Now, two years into the famine, Joseph's brothers arrive, and each arrive to him. They and their families are hungry, but there is food. They just have to speak to Joseph in order to purchase it. And of course, they don't recognize him. But Joseph does. And at this moment, we might imagine once Joseph has those deceitful, mean-spirited, perhaps even evil brothers in his presence, we might think Joseph would lash out with anger, curse them, because you know he hasn't forgotten. He might even show off his grand position, that beautiful garment that Pharaoh gave him, the signet ring from the Pharaoh that shows his power. He might even revel in that. Or maybe he would just simply choose to ignore them and repay them of their lack of concern for him in the pit by just ignoring them. But that's not what he does. No, he confirms to his own satisfaction that his brothers have changed. They regret what they've done. And so he is desperate to rejoin his family, his community. So he reminds them of his origins, his relationship with them. But most importantly, he reminds them he, he holds no ill will for them, despite being cast off. Because as Joseph said, it was God who brought him to Egypt so that he could offer his family new lives of comfort and ease. And the fact that he does do that is witness to Joseph's spiritual wisdom and maturity. It's worth a moment to stop and reflect on the actions of Joseph's brothers, but then the blessings received by Joseph and others around him. And the very warm reception and loving care offered by the wronged brother upon whose head they heaped hatred and despicable actions. Sift through all of that and it's worth considering that selfish and sinful actions can momentarily thwart divine intention. But it is temporary. Be certain. God is able.
to reframe the evil and misguided actions and bring good. Often I hear people say they don't know what God wants them to do. And believe me, I'm not one to make light of the work it takes to find God's personal call for each of us. But I think what's important about Joseph's story is to recognize as we seek God's purpose for us, we do not need to encounter a burning bush like Moses. We don't need to have hot coals pressed to our lips like Isaiah. And we don't have to give up the fishing nets like the early disciples or even have a dramatic conversion like Paul did on the road to Damascus. Because what we see from Joseph is that he already had what he needed to do the work he was called to do. All the opportunities that came to him by way of the wretched actions of others, he continued to live his life to the glory of God and he was ready regardless. God didn't ask anything of Joseph that he had not already prepared Joseph to do. And if you follow Joseph sort of from the beginning, the 17-year-old in a pit, through the young slave, earning trust as governor of Pharaoh's household, and a, a prison inmate for 13 years, and then second in command over an entire country, that's pretty amazing. And I will say, by Joseph's example, we can see that we too are able to live our lives in ways that honor God in relationship, in business, in governance, because God has freely given to us the ability to do that today. Joseph didn't wait until he was free. He didn't wait for the respect of Pharaoh. He didn't wait until he was a, a notable and respectable leader in the country. He didn't even wait for his family relationships to be reconciled. He simply worked every day to the glory of God, wherever he was, and the Lord blessed him. So today, be encouraged and know, dear ones, that you have everything you need to live and to work to the glory of God today. <laughs>